Hello, and welcome to the Stockton Buddhist Temple's very first virtual Obon celebration. My name is Corey Louie. And my name is Chad Shimazaki. It's great to see you again, Corey. As you all know, we normally all get together around this time to celebrate Obon and Bazaar, but unfortunately, we haven't been able to do that these past two summers because of the pandemic. So many of my summer memories growing up revolve around preparing for the Obon and Bazaar, whether it was driving to Stockton Tuesday and Thursday nights for dance practice or creating grab bags and counting game tickets for the game booth for my Auntie Candy, these past two years don't feel the same to me. Me too. I think I've spent more time in the game booth, soda booth, and hamburger booth than eating at the bazaar, and that's saying a lot. We want to start the virtual Obon celebration by saying thank you to the many church members who have helped us present to you the very first and hopefully last virtual Obon celebration. To get things started, Here's a temple introduction slideshow put together by Darlene Bagshaw.
Thank you so much to Darlene for putting together that slideshow for us. Those pictures bring back so many memories from previous Obons. I can't believe how young Carter Uemura looked in that. Chibata, who is actually my paternal grandfather, requested that this specific shaped ceiling be built when the temple was relocated to our current site. This resembles two palms together, which we call gasho. Directly in front of the altar, you will find the koro, or incense burner, that is made of metal and it sits on a lacquered wood stand. This incense burner is often decorated with figures of dragons, elephants, Chinese lions, or a lotus. Incense burning was an act of purification during the time of the Buddha. Today, burning of incense has a very symbolic meaning of impermanence. This bell is called a daikin, which translates from Japanese to English as large bell. The shape of the daikin is of Chinese origin and is said to be the shape of Shakyamuni Buddha's begging bowl that he used while he was a monk. The tone of this bell symbolizes the impermanence of all things. The statue of Amida Buddha stands in the Gokuden, which means Palace Hall. The center altar enshrines the Gohonzon, or central or principal object of reverence. In our school of Buddhism, which is called Jodoshinshu Buddhism, the principal object of reverence is Amida Buddha, and in our case, is the standing wood statue. The statue leans slightly forward which represents Amida Buddha's wisdom and compassion always coming to us and always embracing us. The right hand also symbolizes this wisdom, while the left hand also symbolizes this compassion. You will notice that the statue stands on a lotus blossom, which is very significant in Buddhism since the lotus grows from the mud, but the blossom rises above the water to grow beautifully.
there are many carvings on the Gokuden, which can include elephants, lions, or dragons, as they are all guardian animals of the Buddha. You may be curious about the arrangements on the altar. This includes flower and candle stands, different incense burners, and vessels for offering food to the Buddha, like rice. Rice is utilized as an offering because it is an important staple of food in all of our lives. There are many different lamps on the altar, and this one specifically is called Kiku Rinto, which translates to chrysanthemum circular lamp. This is due to the decorated pattern of chrysanthemum flowers. This circular light represents enlightenment. Located to the right of Amida Buddha is a portrait of Shinran Shonin. Shinran Shonin is the founder of Jodo Shinshu and is one of the great figures of Japanese Buddhism. Located to the right of Shinran Shonin is a portrait of Shotoku Taishi. Shotoku Taishi was an imperial prince, the second son of the emperor of Japan, Yoome. He too was a Buddhist and a strong supporter of its acceptance and spread in Japan. Shotoku Taishi is regarded as the father of Japanese Buddhism. Located to the left of Amida Buddha is a portrait of Renyo Shonin. Renyo Shonin was the eighth head priest of our Jodo Shinshu School of Buddhism and is a direct descendant of Shinran Shonin. Renyo Shonin is largely responsible for the restoration of Jodo Shinshu Buddhist teachings in Japan. And the tying of the obi. Good afternoon. Each year in August, the Buddhist Church of Stockton holds its annual Bon Odori in conjunction with their two-day bazaar. Bon Odori, or Gathering of Joy, is a Buddhist tradition to honor the spirits of ancestors and loved ones who have passed away. Family and friends gather together to dance and reunite. Because of the pandemic, we were not able to have our Bon Odori for the second year in a row. Hopefully, we can resume next year with a big celebration. Mrs. Kimi Ishihara will be demonstrating how to tie obi with her granddaughter Leah as her model. Mrs. Ishihara has been dressing dancers and tying obi for over 60 years. The summer dress for our festival is called yukata, which is made with colorful cotton fabric and is much cooler than the traditional silk kimono. Hoppy coats are a shorter and more casual version of the yukata and are also popular for the summer. Obi is the belt used to complement the yukata and is usually made of silk or cotton fabric. Mrs. Kimi Ishihara will now begin the demonstration. Kimi will now begin the demonstration. First, she places the yukata on Leah and adjusts to about ankle length. It is important that the yukata opening in front is placed left over right. She uses a himal starting in front, crossing in the back, and tightly tying off in front. The excess himal is tucked under. Himal is a long strip of cotton cloth sewn together and used to secure the yukata in place. This step is to maintain the length of the yukata. Kimi now adjusts the excess layer of the yukata evenly, in front and in back. She uses another himal to secure this layer in place. She checks the front and the back again to make sure it is even.
Now the obi is being placed. Starting in the front with the shorter side held in the back. The longer side will completely wrap around again and end up in the back. Once that is done, she holds the shorter side, tying it tightly. The longer side is now being folded a few times as this will become the bow. She holds the center of the bow and brings the shorter side, which is now folded in half lengthwise, over the bow and under, and repeats while pulling up firmly. The excess obi is then tucked in under the bow into the inner layer and pulled through. She rolls up the remainder of the obi and tucks it inside. Finishing touches are made by straightening and adjusting the bow. This is called the Bunko Obi, or basic style. Beautiful! Kimi will now quickly demonstrate another style with a double bow. Wow, beautiful. Thank you, Kimi and Leah Ishihara. Thank you very much, Kimiko and Stephanie. I don't know what seems more tiring for you dancing in the yukata or dressing someone in it. You're right, Chad, but hey, I know you'll enjoy this next segment we have. It's our first food demonstration. The Uomura family is here to show you all how to make one of the temple food items at Obon, the Spam Musubi. Finally, our first food segment. Spam is always one of my must-have items at Obon, and because of the Taste of Obon fundraiser the church is putting on this year, we will all be able to get some. Just make sure to come during your scheduled pickup time to grab a quick taste of Obon. Spam Musubi recommended, but not required. 
All right, Chad, enough talking. Let's get into the video on how to make spam used to be from a true professional. Hi, my name is Ella, and today we will be making spam musubi. The ingredients you need are rice, roasted sheet seaweed, um, spam, and futakake is optional. Some tools you may need are a knife, um, a spam musubi cutter, and a spam musubi maker. We have a singular, singular and a double. The first thing I did was chop the Spam with this Spam chopper that you could get on the internet. You could also use a regular knife if you don't have one. I forgot to mention that we need a sauce to boil the Spam in and the sauce that we are going to be using is the Yoshida sauce. Um, we need to cook the Spam one minute on each side so I'm going to put it in. This sauce can be found at any supermarket. And you are going to cook on medium low. After a minute or two, you have to flip them over. Now that we have our Spam cooked in the Yoshida sauce, we are going to assemble it. The first thing I'm going to do is grab one of the roasted seaweed sheets and lay it under the maker. So I'm gonna go like that. And the next thing we need to do is get some rice and lay it about like one third. <clears throat> so, I'm going to go like that. And you're gonna do it all the way at the bottom. <clears throat> and once you have that flattened out, you are going to put your spam in. So you grab one and put it on this side and grab the other and put it on this side. Next thing you wanna do is get more rice. Oh yeah, I forgot. We are going to add the futakake and you just sprinkle some on top. And then we put another layer of rice on. And you're going to flatten it out like we did on the bottom. And the last step is to um, smash it down with this little thing to make it all even. <clears throat> and once you do that, um, it is time to put it together. And I'm gonna take it out with a knife. And an, a way, an easier way to do it is to get the knife wet so the rice doesn't stick to it. But yeah. And so now I'm gonna take it off. And it's like that. And the last step is just to fold. And there's your spam musubi. You could also cut it in half right, right there 
to make two of them. And that's how you make your own homemade spam mousse. The last step is to have it officially taste tested. And this is my brother Carter and he's gonna try it. Mm. It's good. Very good. Is it made well? Yes. How many can you eat? Have it. Hmm? <laughs> okay, it must be good then. Thanks, Carter. And thanks, Ella, for showing us how to make Spam Musubi. Wow, Ella is quite the chef. You know it must be good when Carter takes a second bite before answering his dad back. I spent many holidays with the Uemura kids, specifically Carter, and I know if he gives a seal of approval on Spam Musubi, it must be great. We also want to thank Derek for sharing our Taste of Obon pre-order drive through This would not be possible without him. When you think of Obon, the dancing always comes to mind. It starts off with the students and teachers, but by the time it's over with, many people from the crowd have joined in on the fun. That's right, Corey. One thing that's great about all the dances is that they are very easy to pick up and learn. And even if you aren't a great dancer, like myself, it's all about getting up and having a great time. And this next segment teachers Ruby Kato, Tiffany Shibata, Carrie Wong, and Candace Hayashi will be showing you how to perform the Shiawase Samba Odori. We encourage all of you to get up from your screen and dance along. Instructions for Shiawase Samba. You're facing the center of the circle, which is counterclockwise. First, you'll start with your right foot and you go and you're rolling your hands right, left, right, tap, left, right, left, clap. Repeat again. Left, right, left, clap. Now step with your right foot and clap twice and down with your left and repeat, clap twice and down. Now come up with your right hand, two, three, tap, left hand, two, three, tap. Now samba to the right, samba to the left, samba to the right, samba to the left. Turn right, seven steps, two, three, four, five, six, seven, clap. And now we'll repeat the steps and two, Oh, yeah. 
too hard to follow along right man i don't know i'm only used to dancing to the home run dance and uh, the ones we're gonna throw the kids in the air i think i'm gonna have to sit this one out next year if we do this in person that's okay Corey. the next segment is perfect for you to catch your breath and relax as we watch a bonsai demonstration by sam adina hello everyone let's do bonsai but before we go on I would like to introduce myself. My name is Sam Adina, and I live here in Stockton, and I've been doing this bonsai hobby for 21 years now. Okay, I have uh, a sample like this one right here. It's a Japanese black pine that I started from the seedlings. So this is about three years old. Okay, so. Now, when you do bonsai, you need to have uh, basic tools like a uh, branch cutter, wire cutter, the plier, tweezer, chopstick, and a sharp scissor. I mean, sharp scissor is must because when you cut the branches it should be or uh, twigs it should be on um smooth cut it's not gonna break uh, or when you cut you have leaving some like uh, it's been uh, um the cut is not nice so it should be a nice cut so the buds are coming out or uh, it's look nicer. I have this uh, Japanese black pine that I've been training for uh, over 10 years now. And see, you see that there's no um, candles, long candles over here on this little level over here and this right here. But uh, because of that, I cut it first on the bottom. That's it. The way how it should be done right here for the Japanese black pine. So the strong one or the growth of uh, trees is usually the top is strong one. So I decandle most on this uh, first, second, third branch below because they're weaker. So I would like the new buds coming out first before the top. So decandle means uh, removing this uh, uh, growth from uh, early this year okay 
why did I decandle this one? Because I like to have this uh, tree to be more compacted and encourage the growth more closer, not uh, elongate, okay? Because if, uh, if it elongate, then uh, it's hunger, it's harder to bring it back to look more small trees, okay? So this one, okay. <clears throat> so, now this one is just like that, cutting, and then around where I cut it, it will give me a new growth, maybe one, two, or up to six buds that come out. And later on, I will remove some of those new buds that came out, and then leaving only two for the next year to grow. And then every year, the same process needs to be done again to make uh, more compacted, okay? So this is how it goes for that. Now it looks like that, okay? <clears throat> so when you do bonsai, you have uh, to choose like uh, this Japanese black pine who is considered as the king of bonsai or I have the, the olives which makes the small leaves good for bonsai. Uh, try that maple, okay? They have the small leaves too and this one drop their leaves during cold season. The <coughs> one that's so called Shimpaku, okay. This one I have it for about eight years too, and training for that years. The soil that I'm using is this one about size of um, let's say uh, 316. This one is Pamis, this one is Akadama, which is come from Japan, and this is a red lava. Okay, so I mix this together. I use that one and if possible, I need to remove the dust. So the drainage is gonna be better and it's good for the tree in the pot. And I don't use the potting soil that you can get it in uh, the nursery or in a um, place where they sell soil because this one will compact it within few uh, watering. Okay, now I'm going to show you my backyard where I have all these uh, trees that I can so this one is, this uh, tree is Japanese black pine. It's about probably 30 years old. And if you cannot get trees from the nursery, see, this one is um, blue atlas cedar. And then this uh, is um, Western juniper, which collected in the Northern California and then the California juniper collected in the Mojave Desert and so on. So this is my yard that's all full of trees, okay? <coughs> so, yeah, these are uh, all the century old um, olives, California juniper, this um, uh, tree from uh, this one is a uh, um, white pine from Japan, and that's uh, the bougainvillea. Okay, you can uh, um, use any tree as long as they are smaller trees, because big trees, big leaves of trees, then it's uh, harder to reduce 
the foliage. And what I mean about the soil, like this one right here, okay? So when you water, it should be like that. And it rain, okay? That's, it should be okay. And uh, I'm doing this for 21 years now and I enjoy it, I love it. So enjoy doing your bonsai. Thank you so much, Sam, for putting together that informative video. I always remember admiring the bonsai displays that we put inside the gym during Bazaar. Crazy how much technical work is put into making the trees thrive. I definitely don't have a green thumb, so my tree would die within the first week. Have you been trimming your bonsai trees lately? Due to the pandemic, you know, I started many new hobbies, but bonsai was unfortunately not one of them. <laughs> Due to the statewide stay-at-home orders this year, many of us have had time to spend at home looking for new things to do. Many found new hobbies, just like our very own Mabel Moradomi. We want to give a quick thank you to Mabel for all the work she has done for the temple over the years, an integral part of the temple's operations and leadership. One of my new hobbies is golf, and I always remember how much work Mabel and Kiyoshi put into the golf tournament. In this next segment, you will get to see Mabel Moradomi and her neighborhood Tai Chi group in action. Good morning. Our Tai Chi demonstration will be by the Gadwall Circle Neighborhood Tai Chi group. Our little group was started by my asking a neighbor, Brian Chan, if he would practice Tai Chi with me in front of his driveway. He later asked me, if I would help start a neighborhood Tai Chi group with him. I was surprised and a little leery as my neighbors are mostly seniors and had probably never ever given it a thought about learning this ancient martial art. Lo and behold, we had some interest. In fact, they liked it so much that they even wanted to practice in the dead of winter with temperatures in the low 30s. Can you believe that? That is dedication. This is what we did and still do during the pandemic and after, meeting our neighbors and going outside in the middle of the street doing Tai Chi. All are welcome to come and learn. We practice Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. free of charge. Tai Chi has been around for over a thousand years. Great for lowering blood pressure, building strength, balance, and managing stress. With all these benefits, why would you not want to learn? Come join us. I'd like to thank Brian Chan for getting us started in an activity I truly believe in. Dennis Chan for all his techie knowledge and Sandy Yamada Francisco for helping me when I am not there. Without all these wonderful people, we would not have our beautiful group. I would also remind you we are not professionals, but just regular people wanting to learn this mystical soft martial arts known as Tai Chi for our health. We will now perform the 24 form Tai Chi. form by raising and lowering the water. Lean to the right, parting the horse's mane three times, starting with the left. Rock back. Parting the horse's mane to the right. Rock back. Parting the horse's mane to the left. Half step forward. White crane spread and swings. Brush knee and push hands three times. Rock back. Brush knees and push hands second time. Rock back. Brush knee. Push hands third time. Half step forward and play the guitar. Also 
tail, roll back, press your forearm, separate hands, sit back, and push. Single whip. Stand up straight and relax. Well done. That's so grateful to bond over Tai Chi, even with the pandemic going on. Tai Chi is such a great way to stay in shape and can be done by people of all ages. After all those calories burned in that video, I think it's time for our next food segment. Watch closely as Dr. Alan Kawaguchi shows us how to sous vide a steak. Hello, I'm Alan Kawaguchi, and I'm going to show you how to make a consistently perfect medium rare steak using a technique called sous vide. Now, if you like your steak well done, you won't need to use this technique. But if you're like me and like your steak rare to medium rare, then this way of cooking may be for you. Now, many of you may say that you already know how to make a great steak, and I'm sure you do. But I'll tell you that steaks cooked via sous vide method comes out with only a few millimeters of brown edge that results from searing the steak at the end. Also, more of the delicious juice is kept in the meat as it has nowhere to go. First, you need to get an immersion circulator like this. This is a device made by Anova, and it costs around $130 at Best Buy. You may want to check Amazon for prices. Many range from $100 to about $200. Next, you need to get a large tub or pot filled with water. This is a 12 liter pot and I've filled it to about 10 liters. Then you have to set the temperature of the emergent circulated to the temperature that you want your steak to be cooked at. For medium rare, I set the temperature at 130 degrees. If you like your steak cooked rare, then you may want to set it to 125 degrees. For medium well, you may want to consider 145 degrees. And for medium, about 138 degrees. 
Next, you take the immersion circulator and you put it into your pot or tub. And you turn it on and let it go until it heats up to the correct temperature. Once it does that, then we'll put the meat into the water bath. Okay, let's now prepare the meat and get it seasoned so it's ready to be placed into the water bath. This is a pretty good piece of nice New York steak here. So, season it the way you like to season it. I like to put a little bit of salt on both sides. A little bit of pepper. And a little bit of steak rub. You could always add some later. Next, what you do is you get a Ziploc bag and you put the steak in a Ziploc bag. This is how you're going to put the meat into the water bag. Now, I like to put a little bit of olive oil in there. Once the meat is in the Ziploc bag, you want to get all the air out of it. And you can use a separate pot if you want to. I'm just going to use my immersion bath here before it gets too hot. And slowly dunk the meat in there in the bag and try to force out all the air out of the bag. Now if you own a food saver machine, you could use that as well. So once I get all the air out and I seal it, there you go. It should look like a vacuum sealed bag, more or less. Now, you could just wait until the water temperature reaches the proper temperature, and then we'll drop it in. Now that the steak has been sealed inside the Ziploc bag with the spices, and that the temperature has reached the appropriate level of 130 degrees, I'm just gonna drop the steak in the bag, in the water bath, and clamp it so it doesn't swim around. And now we wait for hour to hour and a half until the steak had reached an internal temperature of 130 degrees. Like I said, we wanna keep the steak in the water bath for about an hour to hour and a half. You could probably go as long as two hours, but you don't wanna go much longer than that. Otherwise, the proteins will start to break down and your steak may not taste as good as it does at the optimal time length. This is for a steak that's about inch to two inches in thickness. Okay, it's now been hour and 15 minutes. And let's take the uh, steak out of the uh, tub right now. Turn this uh, Immersion cooker off, and as you can see, the steak looks a little brown. That's what it's gonna look like. That's okay. And the idea here is, get a paper towel, we take the steak out of the bag, and we basically are going to dab it and dry off all the water. Okay. And once we do that, the steak does not look very appealing now, but this is, is where we have to sear it next. Okay, now that we dried the steak out, paper towel, we throw it into the skillet. And you probably want to sear it on each side all about 20 to 30 seconds, about a minute and a half total. If you want, you can always store on the grill as well at this point.
You may want to sear it on all sides as well, like I'm doing here. Just to get a little char on the steak on all sides. Okay, so here's the cooked steak, and we'll just slice it right here. Now, see, as you can see, nice and pink in the middle, and see, see the sear mark around it. Most of it, it's still nice and pink. Got just a very small edge of the uh, sear mark on there. So, there you go. Sous vide style steak. Now it's time to eat it. Wow, Dr. Kawaguchi, that steak looked perfect. Any chance you'll be selling some of those during the Taste of Obon fundraiser? My mouth is watering right now. That looks so delicious, and it even seemed that hard to make either. I think I'm definitely going to add that to my repertoire. Well, Chad, now that we just had a food demonstration, I think we need to balance that out with another activity. This time, a demonstration by the Stockton Kendo Dojo. The Stockton Kendo Dojo practices at our church on Tuesday and Thursday nights and are always a hit during the bazaar. Here is Alex Sakata with an interview with the man who runs the dojo, Mr. Anthony Cabral. Hi everyone, I'm Alex Sakata, and today I'm here with Tony Cabral, the founder of the Stockton Kendo Dojo. Um, we will have a brief conversation about the Stockton Kendo Dojo, followed by tapes of a previous demonstration. Um, Tony, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to educate us on Kendo and the Stockton Kendo Dojo. Well, thank you, Alex. Appreciate it. Um, okay, so first of all, can you give us a brief history on the on your dojo and the art of Kendo? Sure. So we, st we founded the dojo here at the Stockton Buddhist Temple in 2012 uh, so we're uh, we're coming up quickly on our 10th anniversary which uh, we hope to celebrate in a somewhat happy fashion uh, provided uh, our current status in the communities gets better and everybody's health is strong but um, so that's kind of a milestone everybody's looking forward um, there was a great void here in this area uh, being part of the Northern California Kendo Federation, uh, there was, you know, a lot of people interested, but they just didn't want to drive 90 plus, you know, 120 miles to get to a dojo. And um, so for many years, myself and my family, we made those drives. And, and my goal at, at, as I got older was to try to answer that call here, that need in this area because um, I knew the burden it would put on families, especially if you have uh, multiple kids, you know, it's tough. Uh, so uh, we reached the point where that was possible and we were approached by some of the leaders here at the Stockton Buddhist Temple at the time, there was an opening and um, it was kind of with uh, shock and gratitude that we uh, took them up on the offer. And so, you know, here we are. Um, so. Kendo, the history of Kendo, uh, briefly, is, is, is pretty complex. Uh, we, could, we could speak probably for a couple hours easily. Um, but around the 13th, 14th century, uh, you know, things got pretty volatile in Japan. Um, and as time went on, as it got closer into the 15th century, there were major changes because of the warring states in that period of history. So. The samurai started, you know, changing some of the way they trained. They had to train. Um, there were less actual battles. Uh, firearms were introduced, uh, and so that obviously changed things greatly. But their soul was in the sword. That was their spirit. You know, their key. They carried it with them every place. That was what had basically developed the country to the point it was. But. They kept training in their own uh, clans. However, they kept killing each other and, and maiming each other. So they had to start working on a development of a way to practice. 
So as, as time went on, the 16th century got there and there was less and less battles. Um, things became more unified and then you had peace, so to speak. And by then they really needed a way to practice. So they started practicing with Vulcan, a wooden sword. This is a Shinai, bamboo. Um, but they were still hurting each other because they were strong, powerful men and um, they were still hurting and killing each other. So over time, they developed the four stave shinai made out of bamboo, tied together with the, le with the leather straps and pieces. And this enabled them to hit somebody uh, with full power and uh, the armor they developed. Of course, it's much more advanced now with technology. It's much safer. Uh, we have modern men's that protect the head um, from concussion and these kinds of things. A little more crude back then, but it gave them uh, much, much more protection uh, than they had. So they were able to continue that and practicing that full spirit. And as times changed, emphasis changed. You know, samurai were always ready to die, right? They were, they weren't, they were fierce people, and that that permeates bushido, and it still permeates the culture in Japan in, in many ways. Um, but this gave them a chance, opportunity to go full speed, practice hard with each other. And then over the years, it just kept developing into uh, the modern sport of kendo now. That's, so that's the short version. As I said, we could, we could have a long conversation. Maybe next time, huh? <laughs> wow, that's really great. Um, anyways, I'm sure our viewers will be interested in the activities here at the Buddhist Church of Stockton. Um, when do you guys hold practice sessions normally? Well, normally, we practice on Tuesdays and Thursday nights uh, here at, from uh, 7 to 9 p.m. Um, right now, because of the pandemic, we're practicing on Saturdays only from 9 to 11 a.m. Um, and, uh, you know, the typical practice for a beginner is, is shortened. It's only an hour to an hour and a half, depending on their age. Um, and of course, adults is a little longer, and the youth are, is the shorter version. Until, until they learn a few of the basics. Uh, but for everybody else, it's a two-hour practice, Tuesdays and Thursdays from 7 to 9. Okay. Um, uh, and if they were interested in learning more, how can they get a hold of you? Sure. Um, we have, you can go to uh, Stockton Kendo, our webpage. Uh, we also have a Facebook page. You can take a look at that. Uh, we have a lot of uh, videos and pictures and things there. Um, and all the contact information is in either place. And, or if you want, you're welcome to show up here um, after we open up, not during the pandemic, but after we get back inside, then you're welcome to show up on a Tuesday or a Thursday night. Okay, interesting. And um, speaking of the pandemic, it's affected all of us. Um, what changes have you uh, made to adapt during this uh, rather difficult time? Yeah, it, it's, uh, so I attended a few uh, seminars uh, online with some senseis in Japan um, that were developing, you know, alternate ways to try and continue teaching. Um, it's tough. The main thing you want to teach is footwork and from the ground up. And of course, that's, that's been, you know, almost impossible. Uh, but some of the other ideas were very practical, and so we, we instituted different exercises than we normally do that we hoped were engaging some of the same muscles. Um, so when we go back, obviously it's going to take time uh, to get that specific group of muscles trained again, or conditioned, I should say. But, you know, we've done our best there. Obviously a lot of conditioning, a lot of striking practice, uh, a lot of subudi. And um, then we've also done, uh, we practice outdoors here at the temple, but we've also set up a, uh, an amplifier and we're doing uh, Zoom classes with some of the higher ranking senseis uh, over in the Bay Area. So that's kind of given the students, especially the new ones that never had the opportunity to meet Tanoi Sensei and, and some of the other sensei, um, to kind of meet them via Zoom. So when that day comes and we're back together, they'll know who they're talking to, right? right? And they'll have heard advice from them already. So that bond has kind of started, you know. So that's probably the biggest change. Okay. Well, hopefully soon we'll get back to a more normal state of practices and resume 
everything to the full extent. Um, uh, one last question. Mm. What is the biggest lesson you wish to impart upon your, on the students? <clears throat> yeah, this is, so this is something I've given a lot of thought. Obviously, we've had plenty of time to do that. Um, I've tried to get them to spend time on self-reflection. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the, the samurai were fearless. You know, they knew they might, they might perish in battle any given day, or they might live long lives of service in, in their particular clan. But either way, fear wasn't something that was known to them. Uh, if, if there were some that were fearful, which, uh, you know, they didn't show it. Very stoic, and uh, but fearlessness is deeply ingrained in Mushido. So what I tried to make is a mental lesson for the students. Um, you know, kendo's. You know, some people say 80% mental, 20% physical. Sometimes I think it's stronger than that, much or much greater number. Uh, you know, physical is important because if you have a weak physique then your mind goes there instead of where it should be, right? So I've asked them to, you know, I started doing this early on, you know, look at the people you interact with. You know, if you go to a store or if you go to a store with your parents, however the situation is, look at the other people. Um, you'll see so many people are so fearful. And I, I believe this is very unhealthy, especially not that it's not warranted, but it's very unhealthy to dwell on that fear, especially for somebody in Kendo who is, is trying to, the best we can, master the art of Bushido. Uh, certainly, we don't have that, uh, we don't have the same danger that the samurai did. But, you know, this is probably as close as we're ever going to get. So, in kind of, in, in a way, it kind of gives them the opportunity because when we face an opponent in kendo, uh, the old the old sensei always said that I can look into your eyes and I can see all your emotions, I can see your fear, I can see your excitement, I can see if you're you're feeling confident, anger, whatever your emotion is, I that tells me what you're going to do. So your emotion is your weakness. So I've tried to get them to look and read their fellow citizens' emotions, uh, you know, not to judge them, but to try to learn what that looks like, uh, because that's that's uh, that's a big part of it. You know, when when you when you especially at a, at a higher level, you know, if you have two Hachidan sensei that cross swords, when they're looking at each other, you know, they may they may stay in the kamai for. I've seen them. 10, 15 minutes, and nobody really moving. And then finally there's an explosion. And it's a, it's a great culmination and a, and a point, you know, a valid strike. And that's because all that time they were reading each other, and they knew that they were both equal, except for that split second. Somebody showed an emotion or a weakness, and the other person was able to take advantage of it. So I've tried to get them to use it as, a, uh, as an exercise, you know, try to make something out of a bad situation. So. Okay, well, that's excellent, Tony. Um, I know you accomplished so much, and we wish you just the best success in the oh. future, and um, especially with national and regional um, tournaments. Um, I hope you all learned a little bit more about the uh, Stockton Kendo Dojo and Tony Cabral. Um, stay tuned with a uh, view of previous um, demonstrations as well as a reminder on how to reach Tony and sign up as a student for the uh, Stockton Kendo Dojo. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Alex and Anthony. To find more information about the Stockton Kendo Dojo, look to the chat for instructions on how to get involved. Speaking of getting involved, it's time for everyone to get up and get ready to learn another Obon dance. This one is the Fukushima Ondo Odori. Before we learn that, we want to remind you about the online auction that is currently going on. That's right, Chad. Up until August 13th, we'll be having a silent auction where all the proceeds go to the church. Some of the items you can bid on are a six night stay in a condo in Maui, San Francisco Giants memorabilia, and gift cards to local stores of Stockton. Check the live stream for a link to the auction page. But back to our regularly scheduled programming here, are the Dharma School teachers showing us all how to do the Fukushima Ondo Odori. All right, looks like it's time for me to redeem myself. Here we go. These are the instructions for Fukushima Ondo. We do this dance clockwise. The first step is take a step with your left, tap with your right, and your left hand is up. Then take a step with your, come to the center and pull your hands back over your left and tap back with your right. Then take a step with your right and tap with your left and slowly get back into the circle, down to three, and clap. Again, left, tap, right, tap, center, left side, tap, right side, tap, center, down to three, and clap.
Thank you to all of our demonstrators. I'm sure all of you at home were dancing too. Great job, Corey. You didn't look as stiff on that one. I'm warmed up now. It's getting a little warm here though. It's great that this t-shirt is very breathable. Speaking of shirts, we would like to thank Carrie Wong for chairing our t-shirt sales. We'd also like to remind everyone about the commemorative t-shirts for today's event. The link to purchase and donate to the church is listed in the live chat below. For our next segment, Izumi Asa will be showing us how to make an Ikebana flower arrangement.
be brisk. Thank you so much, Izumi, for putting together that informative video. Are you going to make me an Ikebana now, Corey? I think I'm going to leave that to the experts, Chad. Maybe the next time we host a virtual event together, I will. You know, ask me to talk about that. I'm honestly surprised we didn't get fired after last time. You know, me too. But speaking of second appearances, here's Mabel to play her suit ukulele. What a transition. Take it away, Mabel. Hi, my name is Mabel Moradomi, and I'd like to welcome you to our first ever virtual Buddhist church bazaar. Our ukulele group was asked to play a few songs for you. Since the pandemic, we have not had many chances to do any practices, so I hope you will enjoy the songs we have chosen. Our first song is Bring Me Sunshine.
free and what you see is what you get. Wow, what an amazing performance. Do you play any instruments, Corey? I actually never got into playing instruments, Chad. Uh, the closest thing I've ever done is playing rock band with all my cousins during our New Year's celebration. Uh, but to be honest, I was never really an artistic person to begin with. You know who is? Kay Freeman, who showed us last time how to make a Kimi Komi doll. And now she's back to tell us more. Take it away, Kay. Hello, thank you for having me again. My name is Kay Freeman. The history of Kamogami style Mataro Ningyo date back nearly 300 years at the Kamogami Shrine, Kyoto, Japan. The Statkam doll class started October 16, 2016. And classes held in one of the uh, um, Dharma school classroom there behind this building. Uh, the uh, 
second Saturday of every month, each month, 10 months out of 12 months, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, so today I am going to demonstrate basic technique of Kimekomi doll. So I made some pictures so easier to uh, understand. So this is the one the kit you purchase. And then you uh, make use the tools to make glue deeper. Sand it, make sure it's smooth, there's no bumps. Because if, if there are bumps, they show up through the fabric. And then, uh, so start cutting your fabric now. Uh, not every single uh, kit have a patterns, but this particular kit comes with a pattern, so I'm gonna use it. So cut the patterns and then place on the fabric. Now you place the uh, pattern the right way on the fabric. Okay, and then go on there. So I pin it and I cut myself already. I made a two of them. And this particular pattern of the uh, fabric doesn't really matter. There's no exact, you know, a uh, pattern doesn't really matter which way, but you really have to learn how to place the pattern in the right direction on the fabric. There's no, um, uh, Sewing required, you don't have to worry about that. Actually, uh, this technique go very quickly. So I'm gonna sit down and show you some basic techniques. Okay, so this is the Groove Maker. And then this is the one that uh, Kimekomi Bera. This is a Meuchi, I put the uh, glue in the groove. So, so I already have done the first one there, uh, there too. And also I, cut this ball into the half so I'll show you what's inside this is not solid wood anymore just pressed to wood and so really light all of them the same way so we have a hole inside the uh, the uh, body okay so so I use this groove maker and then dip in the water and then just going through the line why because it make you group deeper and also glue sticks better. So then I pick up the glue and then use this mewchi and then you sometimes too, too much is no good. So just kind of rotating. Now you don't have to put too much. Sometimes it's too much actually um, seeping through the fabric and that makes a little mess. So just roll the mewchi, try to put the glue in the groove evenly. And especially beginners, uh, kind of scared, you know, you're kind of learning, it's kind of slow. It's, oh, maybe the glue um, dry up. Don't worry about it. If you dry up, you dip in the water in the groove, reactivate, reactivate activate the groove. So because the glue is already in the group, you know, just put the little water and activate that now. Okay. So when you place the uh, fabric, make sure you put it in the right way. Okay, so I usually um, use my fingernail to locate it because sometimes this one hard to get the groups. I just use my fingernail to go through this. Make sure no wrinkles, no buckling, but um, you don't have to press hard yet because just, just you know, getting. And also, the if you use uh, patterns, usually you cut a little bit bigger. I told my beginner students make sure that cut bigger than cut small because you always cut bigger patterns. But if you're too short, you can't add glue together. So make sure that. So this is a pattern. So you use the bella and push into the group just this manner. Okay. So like that. Then sometimes you, I, I usually show you how to take it off and you can see the slight patterns of the on the clock. 
and I use a scissors, kind of trim it like maybe one eighth inches. You don't cut on the line because then you cut off too much, uh, too much. So anyway, um, now when you cut it around it, excess cut again. So anyway, put it back the way it was. That's kind of a little tricky part. And if you're not all the way exactly, don't worry. You're big enough to cover. So again, I use the fingertips to do it all there. Oops. I got the wrong, I told you, I went to the wrong <laughs> section. I guess I'm a little nervous, I guess. I don't have to be, but I'm nervous, so. Actually, you don't really have to take it off if you don't want to. That's your choice to make. But I just use, showed you the demonstration purposes. Since so obviously I didn't cut too much, so use the scissors. And then once more, you press into the groove with the bella. Okay, pretty much it. So I'm going to use the scissors and cut. Closest the groove. Fabrics are already um, in the groove. A lot of students make mistakes and oh, I goofed. And if you have extra, then I can pull up carefully and then uh, make it work. Especially this type of fabric called Chidi Men. Chidi Men kind of stretches, really forgiven fabric. Some fabric is so thick, it's really hard. So, it's ready to use the bella to uh, tuck it in. Now, tucking it in is not simply digging. You have to kind of tuck and under, okay? So it's still too much, so you have to trim it a little bit more. A lot of people also tell me, I have arthritis in my fingers. How can I do that? I have arthritis in my fingers too, but there is always the way, okay? so. Tuck under, tuck under. See a nice clean line. Sometimes when people uh, don't cut off enough and they pushing so hard and it's not working. So what you should do is too much because this fabric will go this way, this fabric will go in that way, sharing the one line. So if you have too much fabric there, it's really hard to press down nice and clean straight line. Obviously, this is too much, so I just trim it again. Uh, you really have to have a good, sharp scissors. It's really frustrating if your scissors doesn't cut. You gotta also make sure that you have good scissors. Invest the money in it. Now, corner, make, kind of make, make sure corner is nice and clean. Okay, so tuck under. Okay, so this end. This is a, that's all the technique. Make sure the middle line is not going to come out. I always, so when you do this way, and then if the, the glues dry out, doesn't stay down, that means you need a glue or you, place uh, water in it, we activate the glue, and it will stay down, right? So this is a final section. So on this side, I'm gonna start from here to tap down. down. Make sure this one stays down, stays down. So this direction doesn't pull this part out, okay? 
it's not that complicated. This is a bit, very basic technique. And uh, and the two with the thing enough that it's easy to get in. But when you make a groove, make a groove deeper, not wider. Doesn't look good when the groove is too wide. That is a little bit too much. Sometimes you, uh, when you get old, you can see. <laughs> I sometimes look, make sure nice and clean with my magnifying eyeglasses. Sometimes you miss that. Like, oh, my, how I miss this. But anyway, that's pretty much done. So I have a two piece done and there's going to be another one on this side. And then I'm going to choose a different color, a fabric, and then go fill everything out. Work on the same one. What I'm going to do is clean up inside nice and smooth. And I'm also, I put the fabric inside and make it just some kind of, I don't know, and add tassel on here. And then just place something in there like earrings or something like that. Okay, so go back to here again. Glue in there, use the Bella, cut it, done. Okay, so this is the one I made recently. This is, I just finished a couple weeks ago. This has been there for a while. Anyway, I show you this program and there's a different courses, the beginner to the advanced and start with on my right side and then you choose a couple of doors or one, one section and move on to another section. And after you complete, I finished this one Oops, this one is that one. So you reach the point there, you probably get certificate. If you're interested, you can get certificate, certificate of completion of the courses. You can have a certificate for teaching and also uh, you can advance furthermore. So I usually show you basic technique. That's all you need to know. So you have to uh, try different doors and then you get additional techniques as each step you go. So, um, and if you think you're not, you're interested, but you're not sure, just come to talk to me and I, I, I sh show you what to do. Okay, anything that you're interested in, because I want you to have, uh, learn how to, to uh, know about some Japanese culture. That's my mission. I want to uh, reach out to the people, teach Japanese traditional, uh, techniques happen to be doll making, my case. So, so thanks so much for your uh, attention and thanks for having me and hopefully everybody doing well and see you soon.
Thank you, Kate Freeman, for that awesome demonstration on Kimikomi dolls. If you think making Kimikomi dolls looks like fun, Kay is a local teacher and will be resuming classes soon. Please contact her or the church office if you are interested. Hey, Chad, have you been paying attention to the Olympics at all? Of course. I love the Olympics. They give me a chance to watch sports that aren't as popular in the U.S., like fencing, archery, and judo. Stockton actually has its own judo club, and our next segment here is a highlight video put together by their club leader, Steve Iketa. Here's Alex Sakata to tell you more. Hi everyone, I am Alex Sakata here with you today to provide some background information on our next segment. I hope you all are enjoying our program so far, providing you a taste of Obon Stockton style. Having grown up with family at the Buddhist Church of Stockton, we have all enjoyed the demonstration programs held on our gym stage. One of the groups that has been with us for nearly all our time on Shimizu Drive is the Stockton Judo Club, currently led by Sensei Steve Ikeda. The name Sensei Masao Duke Yoshimura most likely resonates with many of you watching today. Back in 1946, Duke Yoshimura founded the Stockton Judo Club. He was awarded the rank of Hachidan, or a ninth degree black belt, by the United States Judo Federation. Stockton Judo Club is in its 75th year of operation and is one of the oldest judo clubs in the Central Valley. Currently, the Stockton Judo Club is led by Sensei Steve Ikeda, a fourth degree black belt, assisted by Dean Komore, a third degree black belt, Greg Scamaris, a third degree black belt, Raul Ochoa, a second degree black belt, Michael Leary, a first degree black belt, and Chris Ely, a first degree black belt. Together, they represent an astounding 200 years of judo experience. Over the years, Stockton Judo Club has produced many levels of champions. Perhaps the reigning star is two-time Olympian Tommy Martin, who represents the United States in Montreal, 1976, and was appointed to the 1980s team scheduled to represent the United States in Russia. Judo is a sport that was developed by Japanese educator Jigure Kano in 1882 and has since become an international Olympic sport and is currently the second most popular sport in the world. The objective in competitive judo is to defeat your opponent by throwing them to the ground decisively to immobilize or force them to submit. Strict rules govern each move and the best practitioners learn to use their opponent's move movements against them. The Stockton Judo Club has generously donated two separate one month memberships to our silent auction. Check out the link provided following my introduction along with information on how to contact the Stockton Judo Club. I hope you enjoyed their invigorating demonstration and thank you all for tuning in.
Wow, that was exciting. Thank you to club leader Steve Ikeda for providing that video. You know what we haven't had in a while, Chad? You read my mind, Corey. Let's do another food segment. Ruby Kato is going to show us how to make mochi manju in a few easy steps. Hello everyone. I'm going to uh, demonstrate how to make mochi manju from the microwave. Um, years ago, I learned from my mother who used to do it on the stove uh, in a double boiler. She steamed the mochiko uh, batter and then uh, she even made her own um, lima bean on for the filling. But today we're going to do it on the microwave. Um, the recipe calls for um, a one pound bag of the koshi on, you can get it at Sakura or uh, any Japanese market. Um, two cups of mochiko, one and a half cups sugar, two cups of water, and uh, you also need the potato starch or katakuriko to flour your board when you're preparing the mochi. First, we're gonna start with um, preparing the on. Um, we wanna do that first and then keep it in the refrigerator while we are preparing the mochi. Um, I've already scooped out uh, about 20 plus or minus balls and uh, about one inch balls and um, put it on a plate and we'll later use that uh, for the filling. Okay, now we will start with the batter. Um, I have two cups of mochi kol, one and a half cups sugar, and two cups of water. And I use a wire whisk to make sure everything is blended smoothly. You slowly pour the water in a little bit at a time and kind of blend everything together. There's gonna be a lot of lumps at first, but um, that's okay, it'll smooth out. Just about done now. Okay, now that your batter is blended together and there's no lumps, we want to set that aside for just a minute. Okay, now um, I've sprayed a larger bowl with cooking spray or Pam. And then now I'm going to transfer the batter into the larger bowl. So make sure we get everything. I use a spatula. It should be thick like gravy, a little bit thinner. Make sure you get all the, the batter from the first bowl. Okay. Now I'm going to cover the bowl with uh, plastic wrap. And then we're going to microwave this on high. Okay, be very careful when you remove the plastic wrap. So, um, because the steam will just shoot right out. Be very hot and careful. Now um, you need to kind of turn the edges a little bit. A lot of it will be cooked already. Okay, and just kind of blend it around. And then cover it again. And I would say, um, for about two more minutes. Now be careful as you're removing the plastic wrap. Okay. 
and then we're going to the bowl's still hot so you need to turn the mochi so this is the consistency of what it should be okay now i'm going to get a floured board Okay, now I'm going to take the kacha kuriko and um, spread it on a cutting board, large cutting board. Scrape the bowl with the mochi onto the board. And this will be very hot. Now um, just pat it lightly with the flour. And then kind of, it's, it's very hot, so wear gloves if you can. And form it into a kind of a long log. If you want to let it sit to cool off just slightly, but it still has to be fairly hot to work with. If it's too hot for you, then just let it sit for a minute or so. Okay, so it should be probably as long as this board and then um, take the middle, find out what the middle is, and just kind of make an indentation and then separate into two pieces, okay? And you can pull it a little longer. Okay, now each strip we're going to make into 10 pieces. Then um, check both sides to see which one's the smoothest and then put that side down and kind of pat it down um, flat. And I do this for all of them. Now I formed the 20 pieces of uh, mochi, as you can see here. And then I removed the um, on from the refrigerator, so it's kind of cool now. And I'm putting um, one ball on each piece. Now that I've put uh, the on onto the mochi, you pick the first one up and fold it like a taco, pinch so it sticks together and then bring the sides in, both sides, and, and pinch toward the center until it's all formed like that. Okay, and then take a little bit of the katakuriko and dust it a little, and you form a little ball. And that's your first one. And this step, you have to move pretty quickly while it's still hot. Pinch all the center uh, sides together. Dust your hand and form your ball. Okay. Okay, now that we're um, done with that process, well, the final step is to take a pastry brush and brush off the excess uh, powder. I usually like to wrap mine individually with cello wrap and then um, place it in these little white um, cupcake cups. So we'll just do a few here.
And um, before you wrap it, I forgot to mention, uh, make sure it's cooled first. And then you can either, if you're gonna eat it right away, just put it in the little baking cups um, or wrap it and then put it in the baking cups. Okay, now we're gonna plate the manju. I have a nice Japanese container or you can use a dish or um, whatever you would like. Um, I've, this particular container holds nine pieces. So it makes a nice presentation. And then um, also one little tip uh, if for those peanut butter lovers, um, you can also, instead of the on filling, you could use chunky peanut butter and um, use a spoon and scoop out about um, like a one inch uh, ball, but I usually roll it in powdered sugar so it, it takes the stickiness away. And then it's easier to um, form with your mochi. So thank you, I hope you enjoyed the video and please support the Buddhist Church of Stockton. Thank you, Ruby, you always do a great job. I'm starving after all these amazing food demonstrations. A reminder for those who pre-ordered food to arrive during your scheduled pickup time so you aren't starving too. Now we're gonna take a look back in time to a time so far back that neither mine nor your parents were even born, Corey. Please direct your attention to actual footage from the 1957 Sakyo no Bonodori, courtesy of Debbie Nakata. Let us know if you recognize anyone in the video. Oh, <laughs> 
Amazing that a video exists from over 60 years ago. I can't even imagine what the world would have been like 60 years ago. Tell us before cell phones and fun were invented, did everyone just ride their horses to a bone? Okay, Chad, somebody needs to take a history <laughs> lesson real quick. Obviously, horses hadn't been invented yet, so everyone must have just walked. That's fair. I bet you they still ended up born with Tycho, though. What else could the grand finale be? Please enjoy these highlights of the Stockton Bukio Tycho.
Let's go, let's give them a big round of applause.
As always, great job by Stockton Bukio Taiko. Thank you for the great highlights. And that concludes the virtual born celebration. We would like to send a tremendous thank you to Susan Bruni, a member of the Stockton Bukio Taiko, who has been a tremendous help in getting this stream put together. We'd also like to thank Mariko Arroyo for her help in editing portions of the virtual Obon celebration. To everyone at home watching, we want to thank you again so much for your support. And we also want to remind you to pick up your food during your scheduled pickup time if you did pre-order food. If you'd like to donate or purchase a shirt, the link will be provided in the chat below. If you have any questions about services, Buddhism, or interested in any study classes, please email the temple. The email can be also found in the live chat. Additionally, if you'd like to participate in the online silent auction, again, the link will be posted in the live chat below. We also have a Facebook and YouTube channel in order for everyone to stay updated on the temple's latest events. Link to these platforms are listed in the live chat now. Once again, thank you so much for spending another afternoon with us. Reverend Kanda Shibata and temple president Mike Shibata will conclude with some acknowledgments. Greetings, everyone. As president of the Buddhist Church of Stockton, I extend the temple's sincere appreciation to all of you who have joined us in this telecast of a case of Obon. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have not been able to physically gather together for our Obon Bazaar Festival for two years. We hope you have enjoyed this mini version of the educational and entertaining aspects of Jodo Shinshu Buddhism and Asian culture that were presented today. Deepest gratitude is extended to everyone who, who participated in any aspect of the production and telecast of this event. We are also truly grateful to the many donors, participants, and consumers of the online silent auction, raffle, pre-order drive through food sale, and 2021 Bazaar t-shirt sale this weekend. We hope, you, we hope you continue to stay safe and healthy, and we look forward to when we can physically meet together in person at the temple at next year's Obon Bazaar Festival, if not sooner. Once again, we extend our sincere appreciation to all of you for taking the time and joining and supporting the Buddhist Church of Stockton in this year's A Taste of Obon. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to take this opportunity to reiterate what President Mike Shivada said in regards to expressing our sincere appreciation for all of your help and support in regards to the virtual our, uh, Taste of Obon uh, programming and also the food pickup tomorrow. All of this isn't possible without your support and love for the temple. And I truly, truly appreciate everything that you've done to continue to support us during this very difficult time. We look forward to seeing you again in the future. And until then, please take very good care. I look forward to hopefully next year when I can meet our temple members and members of the Stockton community at our next uh, Obon and Bazaar, hopefully in person. Until then, take care. <laughs>